uh, installment of the Ride Along Radio Show. Um, today is uh, Thursday, February 26th, and um, the Ride Along Radio Show is devoted to tackling the issues of the day uh, using our police experience. Uh, Gil and I worked together for a number of years as the Kent Lee who's out tonight. My name is George Holt. I'm Gil Contreras. And um, we go about, uh, we, we offer our perspective on these things based on our training experience and our right. own political leanings. Um, and so we like to think that that gives us a little bit of credibility to talk about these things, or at least uh, we're not just talking out of our uh, ears. Right. But the, the thing that, you know, that drew me when you asked me to participate in this, the thing that drew me is uh, the ability to speak unfiltered. You know, I, yeah. I, I, I don't, I, I'm not a politically correct guy. I'm not a touchy feely guy. Right. You know, I, I don't cry very easily. Um, if people, uh, you know, take issue with me, whether it's online or, uh, you know, in a phone call, um, you know, I can stand my ground and, and I have the facts to back up the things th that I have to say. The only thing is when I say the things that I say, I, I, if it hurts your feelings, I really don't care. Well, and that's the thing, right? And that's what you're getting from us is the pure, unadulterated uh, opinions, unvarnished opinions that we have. And you figure now that we're separated from law enforcement, we're not worried about uh, consequences and repercussions and retribution right. from the administration or anything like that. So we call it ride along because we're trying to give you the experience of what it's like to be in the car right. with two veteran police officers. And you'd be surprised about some of the things that get talked about. Um, or <laughs> maybe, maybe at this point you wouldn't be surprised. But. Yeah. But if you saw end of watch, you know, I, I, just yeah. thought, I thought the you know, they captured the, the, the relationship of the two guys in the car. I just thought they captured it. You know. Exactly. Very. It was like a, watching a young uh, Kent and Gill. Well, I don't know about all that. Except you guys, except you both made it. Like, uh, it, it was it was more like, uh, it reminded me of me and Tommy, Tommy Segovia. Oh, yeah, Scooby, sure. Yeah, Shout out to Scooby. He, he was, by he the was way. my partner for a number of years, and, uh, you know, he's going to be pulling, He's about to retire. He's, he's about to pull the pin. Yeah, good yeah, for him. After 30 years, and, uh, you know, he, he's earned it. Um, he and I were in an uh, Austinville shooting together back in the day, and, uh, you know, I love that guy. I'll just tell you that right now. No, dude's a well-respected cat. He was yeah. gone by the time I got to our department, but he was, yeah. his name was still ringing. And yep. I've met him since then just uh, through uh, yeah, a good social guy, stuff. So. So, yeah, good dude. So uh, what we typically do is we jump into the show and we do a follow-up from last week's show. Uh, and last week's show was what to do and not to do when you're contacted by the police. And, did uh, we have any response online? We did. Oh, actually, we, did. We, got, okay. we got tweets from uh, <laughs> uh, C. Wimbush. And he says, uh, let, me, let me give an exact quote. Hey, fellas, I really like your show, but I have a small issue from it the other day. When you mentioned that the officer, talking to you, Gil, asked if you had a gun and the other officer unstrapped his weapon, you made a comment that I work at a TV station and you better be right about this. To me, that is a threat to the cop because if you were black and said that, then nine times out of ten, you were getting taken down with force. I've seen it and been part of it. I just thought his approach to it was off about what you need to do. And then he gave an example of what not to do. So that was uh, the, the pushback we got from uh, C1, but she was at, at Fly High for Dallas. I'm not even sure I understood that. Well, what he's saying is that um, here's what you do when you're contacted by the police. Right. But he felt that when you told them, hey, I work at a radio at a TV station and you better be right about this. I'm a reporter for. Oh, correct. Right. Then he was saying that was an example of what not to do and that you were able to get away with that because you're not black, basically, is what I took. From oh, that. I again, I, I get the Mexican pass. Apparently, there's Mexican privilege. <laughs> you know, why the white it's people have white. Wait, it's brown privilege. Brown privilege. That's yeah. ridiculous. Uh, the reason I said that, and the way, and I and I said it the way that I did, when I did that, that took the wind out of that officer's sails. Well, see, and that's the cold part. And I commented then, why do I have to identify myself as an off-duty or retired right. police officer? Why do you have to identify yourself as a right. journalist in order to be treated a certain way? Everybody should just be afforded that. That's right. But when he did, when you know, when I said it the way I did. He changed like that. Yeah, it's amazing, then isn't he it? He immediately became nice. And he goes, are you a cop? No, were you? Yeah, okay. Well, and, you know, and then we went into all that. Right. But his whole body, everything just shifted. But, but prior to that, when he said, do you have a gun? Have me, you know, so I'm stepping on the sidewalk, and I see his partner, you know, unsnap and is looking at me. Right. <laughs> and he hasn't talked to his partner. So yeah, I was like, whoa, whoa, sure. whoa, whoa, Chill whoa, out, whoa, whoa. son. Yeah. yeah. Well, you said his older guy contacted you. Yeah, well, thank God that, you know, the FTO is the guy who, who made the contact. Yeah, exactly, without, without freaking out about it. Um, okay, so that was the only uh, pushback we got That's on, it, huh? on uh, social media. Yeah, we I'm got, surprised we because got a tweet. The, the, ba the basic message is don't break the law. 
Well, and com- comply now, complain later. Uh, comply. Comply now, complain yeah. later. If you want, and not that you shouldn't complain later. If you think that you got mistreated, if you think that you were disrespected, you should certainly complain about that. That's right. But comply. Everything's so recorded. You can complain. Everything's recorded now. So you know, um, I, I you know I, I'm not going to take a stand out there on the street. Um, however, I'm also not going to give up my rights. Right. You know, um, if you know, just like I did that night, if I were to get stopped on my way here, you know, if if I were to just get stopped and this is on the passenger seat, and and the officer walks up and sees the canine sticker and then you know and says, hey, uh, you know, oh, you're not on the job anymore. Okay, uh, is, do you have a gun in the car? What's your answer? My answer is no. Okay. No. That's the- if you stop me for traffic, right? Right. Some see, traffic violation. Well, that's the thing, though. Like we said, you never really know why you're being stopped. Well, officer knows, but you never really know why you're being stopped. Well, most people do. Like they, you have an idea, but you never yeah. know for sure. Because I've never, never sure. been stopped, and I didn't know what I had done. Oh, I, I like, have. Investigative stops. Oh, well, here we go. No, I'm just yeah, telling here, you, it's here happened. We, here we go. Here it's right. happened. I'm not making that up. It's happened to me. I've been stopped. I, I was coming home from work one night, um, uh, leaving out a Rampart division. I get on the 110 freeway, and there's a black and white behind me. I'm going home. At the time, I lived in Southeast Division, going southbound on the 110, and uh, they light me up around USC. So I get off, and I guess it took them that long to run my plate or something. I don't know. And uh, officers walk up to the car. They'd already run my plate, confidential plates. Okay. I deem myself, and uh, I goes, oh, okay, well, hey, Sarge, you know how it is. No, no explanation for why you stopped me. Or not slow down, nothing. Just say, hey, Sarge, you know how it is. And, and essentially what they were saying was it was graveyard shift, not a lot going on. I guess I looked like a good stop. I don't know. And that was it? They didn't even ask the... I didn't. And I, you know what? I was trying to get home. So I just said, okay, cool. Thanks. Bye. Mm-hmm. I remember but, I got stopped in an unmarked car. <laughs> you were in an unmarked vehicle? Yeah. With E-plates on it, right? There's no lights, but wow. it, had, it had E-plates. So they didn't run the plate? It was a freaking CHP officer. You know, she, she gets... I, you know, I'm, Maybe she thought you were like environmental services or some other non-storm I, position. I don't know what she city. thought, but so she, she, was, she lights me up. <laughs> I pull over. She walks up on the passenger side. I roll the window down and... I, I go, hey, what's up? And she goes, uh, you're going kind of fast there, aren't you? What? And I said, well, I don't know, was I? <laughs> and then she starts, what did she figure it out? And then she says, uh, she says, yeah, you were actually, you were going whatever number she said I was going. I said, oh, okay. And then she said, well, let me see driver's license, uh, registration, and proof of insurance. And I said, well, I'm a police man. This is a police car. I have no idea where the insurance thing is because I've never right, seen it. Exactly. I've never seen the registration. I have no idea where that is. However, my gun and my badge and my ID are right there. Right. And then she looked at me. She looked at my bag on the seat and she just shook her head. She's like, oh, man, I just knew this was a state car. No, 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 no. Because remember, now it all says exempt across the top. But remember that the, the, the um, the little shape around the E used to be different. Right. State the, cars had state a diamond. State was a diamond. That's yeah. right. And we ha- I had the octagon. We're getting into all kind of esoteric <laughs> police talk here. But <laughs> but anyway. Uh, if you're a California police officer, you know what we're talking about. But anyway, so. I think. I'm going to tell you what I think. I think because, you know, had my hair slicked back, Ray-Bans. Right. I think she just wanted to say, she just wanted to see who I was. That's what really? I think. Maybe. I think she Maybe. just wanted, she just wanted, so, see, that's she just wanted to talk to a brother. Stop. She just wanted to talk. It was no investigation. Oh, she, she was trying wanted, to get at you? She just wanted to talk to a brother. Oh, she, I see. You know, she kind of after oh, I, she was trolling. After I, I said, it. I'm a policeman, this is a police car, you know, she just kind of looked at me like, what's up? <laughs> <You know? laughs> hey, it happens. Um, it, doesn't so that happen, was, it don't happen anymore to me. Let me just be clear about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in case LeBou was watching, it doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> Hi, Boo. <laughs> Love you, mean it. So um, the news of the day segment, we're going to get into Pope Francis in a second, but I, I want to talk about the article you posted the other day about that Oregon sheriff Yes, who said that uh, he was having difficulty recruiting people to be deputy sheriffs because marijuana is now legal in Oregon and there's not enough people who can pass the, uh, the drug test. Right. Uh, I don't understand why if it's illegal... That's an issue now, unless you just have a no smoking policy. Period. I, I don't know. Well, I think that's how it's going to be for law enforcement. I mean, it, it it already is. You know, one of the biggest problems in and when I was the chief's adjutant, I used to go to these uh, meetings with him. Uh, we would go to the uh, L.A. County Association of Chiefs of Police, you know, local chiefs. And back then, in the mid mid eighties and in the late eighties, um, they were the, the the thing that every chief complained about was they couldn't find a police candidate 
that hadn't at least tried crack cocaine what? At, the, at the time. They they couldn't find them. So this is why they began really to looking. this is why they began to mani- manipulate uh, standards because they just you just can't find these. Okay, they, they now couldn't see, find these people. Now marijuana, I could see back in the but day. Crack though, cocaine. Back in the day, even if you if you smoke marijuana, if you said, "Hey, have you ever smoked marijuana?" and you said yes, and when I was in high school, okay, well you're DQ'd for right now. You know, come back in three years. Well, it depends years, on how long it was. It depends on how old you were and how long ago the last use was. Right. Right. Now it's like six months. Right. Yeah. <laughs> if you haven't done it in six months, then okay, you're good. Yeah. And cocaine. Yeah. Now it used to be cocaine was a disqualifier for right. life. Now I think it's five years on cocaine. If you haven't done the cocaine in the last five years, yeah, marijuana I don't know if it's five. I even think that it's less than. You know that. what? I think you're right. I think it's two years. I think I think for it's cocaine less than is six months for marijuana. Yeah, and cocaine is a felony to possess. Right. I guess we forget about that part. Well, you know, in California, uh, communist California, you know, we want to decriminalize everything. So, you know, yeah, but we we're, haven't yet. Well, we're, we're 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 with Prop 47. We began. We we began that slide down that slippery slope that everyone, okay. But until we get there, everyone I mean, I, talks that, about the thing with cocaine. I mean, I guess because it's a social drug in some circles, and there's a lot of college kids were getting DQ'd or, or whatever. But uh, I don't know, man. Back when I was coming on the job, when I was processing, and when you were processing in the '80s, cocaine, you were done. If that's you right. if you admitted to that, you were never going to work as a cop. Yeah, and that's that's changed now. Yeah, and so this this problem that the Oregon sheriff is running into is the same problem that they're having in urban areas. And in fact, today I just saw an article about Chicago PD doing a minority recruitment. They don't even want white officers. They want minority officers. Well, see, here's the thing. So does that mean they recruit in minority areas and they just get whoever comes? Or they're telling white officers you need not apply? (laughs) I I, I think the one in Chicago is for right now uh, white officer. Candidate? Well, all they're going to do is so, just sandbag you in the process. Stand by. What they'll do. They'll just sandbag stand you in the process. Because in the picture with you know it, that went with the article it had you know a couple brothers you know filling out paperwork. <laughs> right, because they're trying to show people, hey, you're welcome to come down. Yeah, but you know we're we're going to run into the same problem when when you have like the courts give uh, a, a consent decree that says, you, you know when when you have the chief of the Los Angeles Police Department, the mayor of the city of Los Angeles. The chief of the Los Angeles Fire Department, when they say things like, we have to have a department that looks like the city that they serve. We have to have black people. We have to have Mexicans. We have to have Asians. We have to have uh, gay. Now we're going to have to have transgender, I'm, I'm guessing. Back in the day when I was interested in becoming a policeman, when I was just a little police explorer at LAPD West Valley Division back in the day, you know, while I was in high school, nobody talked like that. Nobody. The only thing they cared was, could you do the job and did you qualify? Uh, if you could pass the test, they okay, They weren't saying fine. it publicly, but we know that back in that time, the Los Angeles Police Department was overwhelmingly white, but the city wasn't. The, that they did not make up the ethnic makeup of the agent of the of the uh, city didn't reflect the right, ethnic makeup if, of the city. But if, if minorities uh, couldn't pass the uh, testing process or didn't get through the entire academy, whose fault is that? Well, hold on now. Let's talk about this though. What else happens? Because we saw this happen with Torrance PD as recently as the '90s, where you know police probation. People think you come out of the academy, you're a police officer now. You really don't have a job until you pass your probationary period. Right. And there are some agencies that have probationary periods for as much as two years. I remember Redondo Beach had two-year probation. So you come out of the police academy, and that means for that next probationary period, and I've had probationary periods for six months uh, for a promotion to a year to 18 months for a, a new mm-hmm. job when you go to a new police department. Right. 18 months is the longest probation I did. Um, during that period of time, if you show up and your boots aren't tied, if you show up late 30 seconds, if you mess up on a report, any reason at all, they can just fire you and they don't have to explain to you anything. Right. And you're just gone. Pack your trash and go back to doing whatever you were doing before. So what would happen in, is what Torrance PD would do is they would go and they say, well, they say we got to hire black officers. So what they would do is they would skip the cream of the crop black dudes and they would take the middle of the pack guys who they knew were going to have difficulty so that they could ding them later. So they would take a guy whose written score wasn't that great because they knew when it came to police report writing, they could get that guy better than the guy who's got the degree in English, that you couldn't get that guy. So they were playing games like that. They got sued for it. Police officers don't make those decisions. What? The the background investigator? No, 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 no. Oh, yes, yes. Because keep in mind, now we're talking about a small agency like Torrance where everybody knows everybody. They got sued for this and they had to stop doing it. They They were taking 
people who they knew they could justify writing out of the program and they skip the other people because uh, your neighbor said that you had a loud party one time or you've got this hit on your credit score, all this objective stuff that, you know, right. you well, that, people that's, out. But that's still happening. That, that oh, your, your neighbor said, or, or a friend, oh, somebody you put in your background hooked us up with somebody else who said they saw you at a party. I knew a guy who had already had an academy date. Yeah. And, and they found out that at a party he had uh, used cocaine. And so they, and he didn't admit to it, so they did him. And he didn't admit. And he, and well, that, that's for dishonesty. But I mean, I know what you're saying because if they wanted him, they would never would have talked to that person, or they wouldn't have said they talked to him. But um, hey, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna have to get into our deal. But I want you to do your OJ show. And um, our next story was the Pope uh, Francis calling for the moratorium on the death penalty. But that goes into our topic today, so we can save that one. Okay. All okay. right. So uh, let's get into the OJ uh, your OJ review. Well, OJ uh, you show. know, OJ is getting deep. If I may, may say that, it's getting deep now. And uh, last night, you know, we, we began to see the intricacies of how uh, OJ's dream team, which really wasn't so much of a dream team, <laughs> but how they began to. Well, that was some good legal minds, though. How, how they began. Yeah. Yeah. So, but how they began to switch focus from homicide, double homicide to LAPD's racist. Right. And uh, that was your legal strategy and, and 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 how that all fell into place. And then last night they went into jury selection and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and it was pretty funny because once they had a jury that they liked, you know, Johnny Cochran and, and OJ are sitting and they're kind of leaning, talking to each other and they're happy with it. You know, the last jury they get is, a, you know, it's kind of overweight black woman. And they both smile and they go, "Yeah, we want that one." So, and, well, and, she remembers OJ as a football and, hero. And Marsha, Marsha doesn't object, so they have their jury. And OJ leans over to Johnny Cochran and he goes, "He goes, man, with this jury, if they can, if this jury convicts me, maybe I did do it." <laughs> <laughs> he said that. He said that. He said. Say that? That's what he said. That's funny. <laughs> That's funny. I was like, oh, my I'm God. I'm going to start watching that, man. I, I'm relying oh, on your reviews to keep me up God. on it because I'm, I'm trying to watch, uh, trying to catch up on vinyl and I'm trying to catch up on Better Call Saul. But the, so uh, I, I uh, use you to, as my Netflix. <laughs> the, uh, uh, but the, the, uh, then they went into how the f they use focus groups and, you know, you know, did you like OJ? How does OJ play with black men, with black women, with sure. white men? With and good attorneys are going to do that. Right. And, uh, and then they, they did the, uh, the, the uh, uh, focus group. On Marsha, and she's on the other side of the glass. And so the guy who's running the workshop, he goes, "So Marsha Clark, tell me, you know, yeah, sure. what, what do you think of Marsha Clark? Anybody? Just right. and he just kind of sits back, and <laughs> this lady raises her hands. Well, she kind of looks like a bitch to me. <laughs> oh wow! And then you know, and then they just each person set out a word, and it was all negative, and you could just see Marsha just cringing behind the glass because and, they got out lawyered by the the NBA All Star team, basically the sharp, slick pros. Versus the civil servants who were trying to get to that level, right? They they knew all kind of had all kind of stuff up their sleeve. So when, when what did they leave off? When they were talking about DNA, you know, they're, uh, you know, the marshal is telling the judge, you know, they want to do a DNA, so they they uh, they want OJ to provide a hair sample. And Johnny Cochran says, well, how many hairs do you want? And then so she goes, well, generally, you know, we take ten samples from each part of the head, so you know, probably a hundred hairs. <laughs> and Johnny Cochran stands up and says, Your Honor, 100 hairs? That just seems overly invasive to my client. Uh, Your Honor, we offer one hair. <laughs> and then they Mark, negotiated about that? Then they, they went to a hearing about it. Oh, he requested God. a hearing about how many hairs they were going to be able to pull out of O.J.'s head. And Marcia's just sitting there stunned because the judge bought it. And, and yeah, because lot, she and wasn't lot. ready for that. She wasn't ready they for that. They got out lawyered. That, they, well, they didn't get out lawyered. I, didn't, I, wouldn't, out I won't say they got out lawyered. They got out lawyered. They, they got... Uh, they never dreamed that a licensed attorney would stoop so low and, and raise such ridiculous uh, uh, objections and then actually have the court entertain those. So they fell for trick play. They, they fell for tricks, yeah. They fell for trick play. It's like it, it, was, it was fraud. But they fell for quarterback sneak. It, it's fraud. It, <laughs> it, it, it reminds me of, you know, one night me and Stuart, we, you know, we worked morning watch together down in Watts and we pull into the gas station at the uh, Century and the freeway. <laughs> and you know, it was the the sign said two hot dogs for one for one dollar. So we walk in to get a coffee and whatever, and there's a black guy in there, and he's just really upset, and he's yelling at the clerk, you know. And then we walk in, and he's kind of taking, you know, taking back a, a little yeah, bit, he's quiet there. down a little bit, because he didn't know somebody called him. But we just right. walked in, so we just want coffee. So he looks at us and he goes, "Man, this is bullshit." And the steward said, "What, man? What, what are you yelling about? Why are you yelling in here?" He goes, see that sign? That sign says two hot dogs, one dollar. 
And and he don't he won't sell them to me. So we look at the guy. I go, what's up? He goes, we don't have any more. We're out. So he's expecting this. <laughs> Somebody's supposed to do something. <laughs> so, wow. So the guy goes, oh man, so, sorry, brother. They ain't got no more. How are they gonna right. say something they don't have? You gotta go, man. You can't be in here yelling like that. Oh man, that's fraud. That's fraud. Well, that's what happened. <laughs> I want a fraud. Though. That's what happened. They got they got defrauded. Okay. All right. Hey, we're going to take a break. When we come back, let me give you the uh, call in number 323-293-3375. And we're going to delve into our topic today, which is reexamining the death penalty. And we'll be right back. Trying to get crazy with Whitey. Don't you know? All right, folks, and welcome back to the uh, Ride Along Radio Show. And uh, thanks for jumping back in the car with us after that short break. So um, I'm George Holt. I'm Gil Contreras. And the uh, premise of the Ride Along Radio Show is, as we said before, you get our experience on our take on topics of the day, our informed opinions on uh, topics of the day. And, and today's topic is reexamining the death penalty. And um, this is topical, this current, because uh, as some of you may know, Pope Francis uh, made some comments this week where um, he, re- he called for a worldwide moratorium on the, uh, on the death penalty. Actually, he's calling for the abolition of the death penalty period, right. but starting off with a worldwide one-year moratorium, uh, quoting basically scripture and saying that, uh, you know, thou shalt not kill means just that, thou shalt not kill. And so um, this is kind of his... Um, I don't Does it say thou shalt not should. kill or thou shalt not murder? I, I, I it says kill. I don't remember. It says thou shalt not kill. It does? Yeah. Can but we, you know what? I don't think... Intern Darren, can we... Uh, Pull up the Ten yeah. Commandments. Put the Ten. We'll Google the Ten Commandments. Commandments yeah, Ten. I don't have my phone. I wish I did. Because there's there's a very different between murder and kill. Right. No, it, it says kill. Thou shalt not kill. I've never even seen it say murder. I just seen it say thou shalt not kill. Yeah. And, I just and, don't, and, and a, we talked about the legal difference between as a the falling two Catholic before. You know, I just I don't remember. That's that's what I'm gonna say. I don't okay. Remember. Yeah. No. Uh, and, and you know, if you think about it, th- we say that. And that falls in line with uh, the teachings of the Bible, even in terms of them being pro-life, et cetera. But we know there's exceptions to that because the Pope's own secret service, the Swiss Guard, uh, has automatic weapons. Uh, They're not less lethal. They ain't tasers. uh, They're real guns. This Pope is an activist Pope, and he's a hypocrite. So his, his comment... Now, if you weren't a lapsed Catholic before, you are now. Well, I, I already said I was. <laughs> so if you weren't before, you certainly are. Let, let me just... Hey, Jesus Christ, you know, let me just cross myself real quick. Uh, yeah, I, I just think that, you know, the Pope's... Uh, um, you know, it's one th- he's, he's calling for end of the death penalty. doesn't say one word about abortion. He had the well, opportunity... No, when he, he, didn't when he, he say that before? When he addressed Congress, he didn't say one thing about it. Uh, he jumped on, on, on the news and, and, and talked about Donald Trump, for God's sakes, and wanting to build a wall. And, you know, people who build walls and, and not bridges is not scriptural. Yeah, you're not a Christian. And it's just ridiculous. It, he has no right to question, and question anyone's faith or anyone's... Well, uh, if anybody ri- can question your faith, it's the Pope, though, Negative, right? negative. He's just a man. He's just a guy. He and the guy uh, he's a know, guy. You know, he's well, a guy know he in a pointy hat. He selected by white smoke. He's a guy in a pointy hat. Now, okay? see, see, all right. all right. Now you're trying, you're trying to get hate, man. I'm just trying to tell you. I'm just trying to tell. I put it on Facebook when he said it. Okay, man. You know, if they invite you to go on a uh, trip to a hunting lodge in Texas, don't go. <laughs> okay, uh, the Illuminati. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen. You know, when you talked about the walls, you know, the freaking Vatican is surrounded by walls. You, you can't even get well, in. Well, he didn't say. He they, said. I think. I think what we was should. His quote. His I, quote was. I, I think if you we speak should only of building walls. We, sh- we and should not bridges. We should go to the Vatican and say, Pope Francis, tear. Down, down this, this wall. wall, yeah, and then okay. and then we should move in. I don't know, fifty thousand refugees from Syria. We should into, come into Vatican to City. come to the Vatican. Come live. Well, come, you know, we'll pay fair, for everything. Yeah. To be fair, to we the don't Pope. have we don't have to vet you. We don't care who you are. You could be ISIS. We don't care. Come, we love right. everybody. He's, he's the one they want, brother. But, uh, please. To, to be fair, he didn't say he didn't stop there and say if you talk about building walls, you're not Christian. What he said was if you speak only of building walls and not of building bridges. You're not Christian. That was his entire quote. Oh, is that right? Yeah. All right. But, yeah. Uh, hey, we got a video that we want to show to kick off our topic. Now, is the video on the Pope? The video is not on the Pope. You want to, you want to, you got something else? You want to no, keep insulting I, the Pope? I, I, <laughs> I'm just saying, I, I'm just saying, I, th- I think the Pope's a hypocrite and he has no place uh, questioning Donald Trump's or anybody else's Christianity. That's between Donald Trump and his God, just like it's between me and my God. Okay. And I agree with that, but I'm not Catholic. Laps or otherwise. <laughs> okay, so we have this footage on the on the death penalty, the pros and cons. Just real quick, little video to get us started on our topic. 
Involved with another crime and you kill one of our citizens, you will face the ultimate justice in the state of Texas, and that is you will be executed. To advocate on different levels the global abolition of the death penalty. Right, so that was a quick little clip talking about the pros and the cons. I actually have two quotes. Uh, one is pro, one is con. And um, the first quote is uh, from John McAdams um, Marquette, who's a, I'm sorry, John McAdams, who's a professor at Marquette University, Department of Political Science. He says, if we execute murderers and there is, in fact, no deterrent effect, we have killed a bunch of murderers. If we fail to execute murderers and doing so would have, in fact, deterred other murderers, other murders, we have allowed the killing of a bunch of innocent victims. I would much rather risk the former. This, to me, is not a tough call. That's pro-death penalty. Uh, Anti-death penalty, and here's a, uh, just a quick little blurb from the man himself. Capital punishment is against the best judgment of modern criminology and, above all, against the highest expression of love in the nature of God. And that was Martin Luther King Jr. that said that. Uh, we have our guest, a uh, special guest on the line. Let me introduce him before we bring him in. Uh, Mr. Dudley Sharp, and he's a uh, death penalty expert and victims' rights advocate. Uh, Mr. Sharp has appeared on ABC, CBS, CNN, Fox, NBC, NPR, PBS, BBC, and now the Ride Along Radio Show. Wow! And on such programs as Nightline, The News Hour with Jim Lehrer, The O'Reilly Factor, Oprah, etc. And he's been quoted in newspapers throughout the world, and he's a published author, a former opponent of capital punishment. He has written and granted interviews about, testified on, and debated the subject of the death penalty extensively and internationally. Mr. Sharp, you there? You bet. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for coming in. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight, sir. This Appreciate is, uh, it. Yeah, we really uh, want somebody to weigh in on this, somebody who's uh, devoted so much of their life uh, to the topic. Now, uh, during your intro, I noted that you were a former opponent of capital punishment. Uh, what made you switch? I fact-checked uh, both sides of the debate for two years. And at the end of fact-checking, as well as uh, reconsidering uh, the moral aspects of the death penalty and sanctions in general, um, I decided that judges or juries should have the option uh, to pick the death penalty in some cases. And that's, I was surprised that I switched, but uh, it happened. Well, you know, there's so many cases that uh, we have seen where people are absolutely terrible people uh, who need to, as I say, go. They need to go. And, um, you know, I, I understand people saying, hey, it's a much harsher punishment for that person to be uh, locked up away in the penitentiary for the rest of their lives as opposed to that. Uh, but then there's other people who say, well, what about those people who, who didn't do it? What about all the people who get exonerated who we would have killed and there could never be any correcting that mistake. Well, no one disputes that innocents are convicted, not just in death penalty cases, but in virtually all cases. And the, the question is, are you putting more innocents at risk with or without the death penalty? And the quote that you gave before from um, a prof professor at Marquette uh, about deterrence, it's it's... There's no doubt in my mind that the death penalty deters, like all sanctions deter, like all negative consequences deter. Um, and nobody's ever proven that the death penalty or any sanction doesn't deter some people. Um, and so when you have the last known innocent executed was in the 1930s. Uh, and since 1973, in this country, we have allowed for at least 14,000 innocent people to be murdered by known murderers. These are murderers that we knew had murdered, and we either let them out of prison and they killed again, or they killed in prison, or we didn't lock them up and they murdered again. 
Well, now, so, let, let me let me ask you something, because you said uh, innocent, and the last time an innocent uh, was executed was in 1930, in the 1930s. That we know of. Okay, that, that we know of, right, that was proven. Um, right. But let's talk about that, because, you know, people like to throw around these, these uh, innocent and not guilty like they're interchangeable, and they're not interchangeable. I mean, there's different... Uh, there's different kinds of, uh, you know, not guilty doesn't mean you're innocent and, and, uh, and vice versa. I mean, there's factually innocent, there's innocent under different definitions. So you, can you delve into that a little bit? Yeah. There's a, a primary quote that's used around the world uh, regarding the United States death penalty today. I think it's the number's either 146 or, our, excuse me, 156 or 157 exonerated and released from the American death row. It's a complete fraud. Um, and what they have done is they've redefined, this is the Death Penalty Information Center in Washington, D.C., what they have done is they have redefined innocent and exonerated and just stuffed a bunch of cases in it. And um, if you call them up, they will tell you they have no idea how many of them are actually innocent because they don't care. They just hope that you'll misinterpret what they're saying. And like well, What said, was the reason for that, though? I mean, the reclassification was to... The, the, the reclassification, the reason they did it the way they did it is they want to make the numbers as high as possible because they're an anti-death penalty group, and they want people to fa think that we're making that many conviction errors uh, when, in fact, the number's uh, probably closer to about 36 than it is to 156. Well, even that, though, right? Well, you, which, which, group, that? which group is that? That's the Death Penalty Information Center out of Washington, D.C. Okay. And the, num the numbers do matter. I mean, uh, none of us wants to make a mistake, and if we do w w make a mistake, we want to correct it in the appeals process. And what they're saying, even with the 156 or 157, they're not saying any of them were executed. They're saying that we identify them as uh, innocent or exonerated under definitions that don't mean innocent and exonerated, and we release them. And what you said is very important for people to understand. Uh, when you're found not guilty, that's a legal standard. When you're standing, when you're a defendant in trial, you're either guilty or you're not guilty. You either did it or you didn't do it. But there is a presumption of innocence that's required by the fact finder in the case, be that the judge or the jury. Right. They have to presume the defendant innocent. Right, presumption of innocence. Everybody, right. Everybody's heard that phrase before. Right, mm -hmm. and that's a, that's a legal standard. That's not a they did it or they didn't do it. And that's why you, you have people found guilty that are actually innocent that hopefully are later released, just like you have people found not guilty who are, in fact, actually guilty. Right. Uh, because because if, if, if the facts can't get you to guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, you have to find the person not guilty. Well, like we said, uh, I, that's like the O.J. Uh, O.J. is a good example of that, right? right? Well, for me, O.J. is. For some people, it's not. Uh, where he was, in fact, found not guilty, and then uh, because of the the shoe evidence uh, in the civil case, they found him responsible. Right. Uh, it, you know, he wasn't found innocent, but he, I mean, or, or not guilty. He, he, he was, he was held culpable, but, uh, yeah, that's a civil yeah. proceeding, though, We, you know. Correct. Exactly. Right. Preponderance of the evidence versus uh, yeah. right. the presumption of guilt. Exactly. Standards a lot lower. Right. Yeah. yeah, versus beyond a reasonable doubt. So, uh, okay, so now, though, what would you say to those who say it is better to let 100 guilty men go than to convict one innocent person? Because, I mean, that's I've always believed that. I still believe that to this day. I'd rather let 100 guilty people go than have one well, innocent person locked away. Okay. It's a good sentiment. But you have to go back to what I said. We, we in this country have allowed murderers to murder again, this is since 1973, at least 14,000 innocent people have been murdered by murderers that we have released from prison or not put in jail. Now, were all those murderers, or were all those murderers subject to the death penalty and they just no. didn't get it? or No, no, they, they're not. The point that I'm trying to make here is the one you're trying to make, which is about letting the hundred guilty go free so one innocent. Yeah, that's the, the consequence ratio, the, of letting those yeah, right. The, the, the ratio is considerably different than that. Um, I mean, we are at, uh, close to 400,000 people in this country 
have been murdered since 1973 by known criminals that we have either not locked up or we have released from prison, again, since 1973. They're not murderers, just all prisoners, people that we have incarcerated or decided not to incarcerate. Right. The number of innocent people that the criminal justice system allows to be murdered, harmed, uh, raped, because of the weaknesses in the criminal justice system is absolutely unbelievable how high the numbers are compared to the, the percentage of actual innocence that we have shown have been incarcerated, identified, and released. Then it's like comparing a molehill to a mountain. But you know what? Those I, cases I, are highly publicized, you know? We always hear about the guy who was found uh, to be factually innocent after he served 25 years, after he served 40 years, and they give the guy a couple million dollars, and they send him on his way. No, and, that's, you know, that's the, you hear about that all the time. Okay, that's the fault of the media, and it's to the benefit of those that always complain about cops and, you know, locking up innocent people. They don't want – there's not – there's not nearly as organized or well-funded a anti-criminal lobby um, uh, other than the people that you know, make profit. In the I was going to say that, right, yeah, yeah. except for them, yeah. sure. They're, they're, yeah, but they don't get out there and go, rah, 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 we're saving a lot of innocent people. Right. Um, it, it, just, it just so <laughs> happens that there's nobody out there or very few people out there saying, do you realize what we're actually doing here? We're, we're releasing, you know, really bad people or not liking them up fairly consistently and have been doing this for a long period of time. And there's one way to know that we have been doing that hugely in the past. Right now, our crime rates, violent crime rates primarily, are at 40 to 60-year lows. Well, that has a lot to do with a 500% increase in prison incarceration. And while there's currently a, a criminal justice reform movement, which has to do with releasing more people from prison, and, and I'm not saying that we can't do a better job than we are doing, because we can. Right. But what, what's going to happen, which has already happened in California, I think it was Proposition 47. 47, right. Yeah. Yeah. What has happened there is in L.A. County, for example, I'm on an uh, email list from the L.A. Uh, Assistant District Attorneys Association. Um, Thirty murders in that county are people that would have been locked up except for Proposition 47. So, okay. but let me ask you this, though. Yes. What, if we had kept those same people locked up for life, Right. We right. would still have achieved the same effect as a death penalty without having to kill them, right? Uh, Except for the people in prison that they murder, but there's people who've been well, on death row in California forever. Right, and that's the fault of the judges in California and no one else's fault. Um, if you, if you, well, but to just to, I'm going to disagree with you. If I thought that life without parole and the death penalty did the same thing, obviously there would be no such thing is anti-death penalty people and pro-death penalty people. Uh, we think they do totally different things. And you're, you gave an example earlier uh, about, you know, maybe people suffer more life without parole. That's not what prisoners tell us. Uh, about 70% of those people on death row, excuse me, yes, yeah, 70% of the people on death row have prior prison time. Right, they didn't get any cherries, right. Okay, why is it that uh, nearly 100% of the people who are subject to the death penalty do everything they can to avoid it, and 70% of those people know exactly what prison is like? Okay, they do it because they much prefer living to dying, just like most all of us do. They don't want to die, and my guess is they're more afraid of death than a lot of us are, not necessarily that they should be, but because of the horrible deeds that they've done during their life, I think they have a higher fear of death 
uh, than most of us did. Well, also, and, you know, the point that you can make, too, is that uh, because they've been to prison before, they don't look at it like the rest of society where you say, man, I don't want to go sit in that penitentiary for no, 20 no, years. They're not afraid yeah. of prison. Right, but, but Dudley Sharp, Dudley, I have a question for his Gil Contreras sure. here. Um, is, isn't what you just said, though, doesn't that kind of fly in the face of your position on whether the death penalty is actually deterrent? Because I don't see it as a deterrent at all. I've, I've never seen anyone who committed a homicide and just prior to committing that homicide said, wait a second, I could get the death penalty. For, no, if I can, I'm just going to do it anyway. Uh, I've never heard of that. So I don't think it's a, I, I don't think, I don't, I don't, let me, can I just, I just want to finish. I, I, I don't think it's a deterrent, number one. Uh, but number two, I'm totally in favor of the death penalty because I think some of these crimes that these guys were sitting on death row, and especially here in California, have committed such egregious crimes that they just shock the consciousness. And 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 for people like, uh, you know, I was going to bring up Stanley Tookie Williams, uh, uh, who was one of the second to the last ones killed or uh, executed here in California. The crimes that man committed were so egregious, he deserved the death penalty. So, but back to my first point, isn't what you just said fly in the face of the deterrent argument? Maybe you misunderstood what I said. What I said was murderers do all they can to avoid getting the death penalty because they fear it more than life. Okay? That's, that's what I was saying. So it doesn't deter them from committing the murder. Right. Well, no, no. I, here, you're looking at about 8,400 people have been sentenced to death since 1973. Virtually all of them have done everything they can to stay alive. Oh, I see. You mean the appeals they, process, they, et cetera, et cetera. They, right. they, they, weren't, they were not deterred from committing murder. I'm not disputing that. Okay? Oh, okay. All right. What, I, what, I, what I'm saying is that they fear death more than life just like almost all of us do. The one thing you said about deterrence, that you don't believe it's a deterrent. Correct. I want, you to think, I want you to think about that for a minute, okay? There are things that you do or don't do every day because there's either a negative or positive influence or outcome if you do those. Every day we did it. We don't walk out of the house naked. We answer the, the clock on time so that we'll get to work on time. We put gas in our tanks so we don't run out of gas. These are all positive or negative uh, effects. They're consequences and repercussions, basically. Exactly. And exactly. And right, that's but, but how, uh, that's if, how, that's if, how deterrence works with anything. If, Criminals. But if, if, I can interject, if I can interject here for a second, however, um, I'm not a criminal. And, and most normal people, people who are not involved uh, in criminal activity, people who aren't criminals for a living, there's a segment of society that they wake up each day and they go, okay, well, it's time to go move some dope, or who am I going to victimize today, whatever the crime happens to be. So for, for those kind of people, it's not a deterrent. For people like me, my boo, my parents, uh, absolutely. You know, you, you meet a guy and go, boy, I sure like to put a bullet right behind his eyeball. Uh, but I'm not going to do it because I don't want to live in prison. So well, it works on it works on non-criminals as a deterrent, I think. But that's with all the laws because it's part of this, you know, this experiment called the United States of America, where if we voluntarily comply with the law, then the government leaves us alone. Allegedly. Yeah, you're presuming something that's not in evidence, and what you're presuming is that when some criminals commit crimes, that all potential criminals commit crimes. There's absolutely no evidence to support that some potential criminals are not deterred from committing criminal activity. And that goes every crime. The, 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 the greatest deterrent that anybody has from committing crime is morality. Uh, is It's wrong and we're not going to do it. The second most is we just don't want to lose our standing in society. And then the third after that is incarceration, whatever a sanction might be. Uh, overwhelmingly, it's morality. And I agree with you completely. Criminals wake up every day, plan their stuff. But let me tell you, criminals look at opportunities. And about 90% of the time, it's not an opportunity they want to take. Why? Because there's a video camera. There's too many witnesses. There's too many things going on. Uh, so they, are you saying they are deterred by certain, by my, certain things? My experience well, is, no. is the opposite and, and, and of that. that. 
Okay. Well, okay. What you're you're ex- you're a policeman, correct, or were? I was, yes. Okay. Okay. You're dealing with people that are committing crimes. Correct. You're not you're not dealing with potential criminals who are not committing crimes. So you're speaking of something that you have absolutely no experience of because you're not supposed to have experience of. That's my point. So you're saying if they don't commit the crimes, they never come to our attention as police officers. But I think there's two kinds of deterrence. Now, the video cameras and all that stuff, those are things that will stop somebody from doing something because they're going to get caught. They don't right. want to get caught. They don't plan to get caught. Why? So a, Why? Well, because they Why don't, don't want to go to jail. They don't want the punishment. But... That, that, but that's, that's the deterrent that, That's true. But see, since they don't think they're going to get caught, they're not really worried about Mr. the punishment will be this. Well, I don't plan on getting caught. So the punishment it's, is exactly. not going to apply to It's me. not a deterrent to not commit the crime. No. I just well, think the way the criminal that, mind that, works is a little that, different. That, that, it, it's no, very no, no, different. No. The, I know it works different. I mean, I've, I've been in this for a long time, and I've talked to a lot of criminals, and I've talked to a lot of victims. I, I understand that completely. But what I'm saying is that if criminals are afraid of getting caught, the only reason they're afraid of getting caught is because of sanction. If by getting caught they got a dozen roses, they wouldn't give a damn about it. Okay, uh, I, I give okay. you that. Okay, so they, they, uh, their only fear is the sanction. And for someone to tell me that the worst sanction is the only sanction that, that doesn't deter anybody, it just flies in, in the face of reason and reality. There are a number of criminals who, they're on the record, and if you go through all the links that I sent you today, which would take you months. Right. We, you, we, you, we looked at them, though. We looked at all three you, of them. You, you will find a number of criminals saying the reason there were not bullets in my gun is because I don't want to kill somebody because I don't want to get the death penalty. Okay, you will find stories like that in there. And the reason that is, is because people really, really don't want to die. I mean, prisoners are much happier or less depressed about serving life without parole than they are serving the death penalty. That's why you don't plea down to life without parole. Uh, excuse me, you do plead down to it. Right, from death. Nobody, ple- nobody pleads up to the death penalty. They right. just don't do it. And the reason is, is because they fear it more than life without in, parole. In states where the death penalty is routinely applied, and I mean carried out, like they're really flipping the switch or, or dropping the hammer on guys, sure. But we've seen in California where people are asking for the death penalty because their accommodations are better on no, death no, row, no. and they're that's, not worried about being executed. Wait, wait. That, yes, but you and I both know that they're only doing that because they know they're not going to be executed. Right, that's, that's what I'm saying, that's sure. Com- that's completely different. So it's not so, the death penalty, it's the, where the death penalty actually being carried out. They're afraid right. of the, not receiving the death penalty, but they're afraid of receiving the death penalty, of well, actually being no, put to death. I mean, there, there, there is a, there is a mo- based on a, a number of the studies, there is a moderate deterrent effect just by having the law not by carrying out executions. The death penalty itself is not the main deterrent. The deterrent effect, if you look at the 28 studies finding for deterrence since 1996, the foundation, the, most of them, the foundation is the execution itself. The death penalty doesn't mean anything uh, except in a couple of studies that said having the law helps a little bit, but it's the actual execution itself which makes complete sense to me. Right, sure. This actual carrying out of it. Now, yeah. now let me let me ask you this. Now, okay. uh, you're familiar with Pope Francis's uh, call for a worldwide moratorium yes, on, on the death penalty, and he's basing that on on the Bible, "Thou shalt not kill," et cetera, no, et cetera. What, what are your take? Well, well, that's what he's saying. So, what, what's your take on that? I know. Well, the, the thing that's so disturbing about what he said was that uh, "Thou shalt not kill" is for both innocent and guilty alike. That has never, this is what's so bizarre about this, I have a number of Catholic theologians that I deal, that I deal with all the time, not to mention I've researched this out the kazoo, as you guys probably have figured out. But um, no, at no time, nowhere, did any father of the Church, doctor of the Church, biblical scholar, theologian, or pope, ever before this pope, has said that 
they don't make a distinction between innocent and guilty life. It, it's never happened before in Catholic teaching by anyone nearly as high as a pope or a bishop. I mean, it's never happened before. Right, but because, now that it has, now well, that no, the pope himself you, you has said it. No, that's fine, but he can't just do that. I mean, he can say it, but it's not church teaching. It's, it's his own personal opinion. The thing that's odd about it is it can't be his personal opinion, because there's nothing that he has ever studied that, that says it's the same for innocent and guilty. Thou shalt not kill, if you look at about half the Bibles, half the Bibles say thou shalt not murder. And the reason they do that is because it's more easily understood. Then that, we talked about that earlier, about thou shalt right. not kill versus thou shalt. I've only seen thou shalt not kill. That's all I've okay. ever seen. Uh, all you have to do is look, go, go to some of the Bible sites, and they have, there's like 80 different translations. Right. And about 40 of them are thou, thou shalt not murder. Right. All, of, all of them, however, including the Catholic Church, makes a distinction that not all killing is wrong. I mean, official Catholic teaching is this which is that you can kill in self-defense, you can kill in defense of others, you can kill in a just war, and you can kill with execution all against an unjust aggressor. All of those are moral killings. So even in the latest catechism, last amended in 2003, if you look at the sections dealing with the death penalty, uh, which is, what is it, 2558 through 2267. If you read through uh, 2258 through 2266, it talks about uh, killing in the context of not killing innocent people. It, it, it spells out innocent, innocent, innocent in those cases where an innocent's at risk and maybe you'll have to kill an unjust aggressor or you can't harm an innocent person. So Forever, uh, Catholic teaching has made that distinction. I've never heard anybody make the wrong distinction that this Pope did, and I, I feel certain that in the months to come, somebody is going to issue a correction because it's, it's not from Catholic teaching ever. So, like you said, it's his personal opinion. And as I pointed out, but he's got armed guards. And, you know, they're going to kill somebody if they come at the Pope. And, yes, and you know, will. and and that's what they they train to do that every day. They're one of the uh, world's finest protection forces. But uh, obviously, there's some exceptions there. All right. And I don't think any, anybody's going to correct him. Uh, by the way, Dudley. <laughs> well, he'll come out. Maybe no, somebody. No, no, maybe he'll no, come no, out and retract it or something can, or clarify. I can, I can guarantee you, he's gotten he's gotten 50 notes from bishops saying, "How could you possibly say that?" I guarantee it. I there's hope no I, I hope he did. I hope he did. Well, there's there's absolutely no doubt that he. I mean. I mean, Catholic scholars are, are, there's just no way that, they've never heard anything like this before. It's just that bizarre. Because many of of my Catholic friends, when the Pope made that statement, and and also the statement about uh, Donald Trump's Christianity, uh, you know, uh, because of this current kind of progressive movement in America, uh, they were, all of my Catholic friends are totally in support of what this Pope, this activist Pope has to say. Well, and the thing is, he's not, he's teaching out of a book that everybody has access to, so it's not like well, his, his word know, is uh, from I, on high, necessarily. Well, no, there, there, there is the important distinction that if, even if you look at the latest Catholic teaching that's in the Catechism, um, when Pope Benedict, now Pope Emeritus Benedict, uh, when he was the prefect of the congregation uh, of the church, which he means he's the highest judge on the truthfulness of Catholic teaching. He was appointed by Pope John Paul II. He said of the newest catechism uh, on the death penalty that it absolutely is a prudential judgment, that any Catholic can remain a good Catholic and disagree completely with the Church on the death penalty. They can, however, not disagree with the Church on abortion, abortion or euthanasia. And so... Well, see, that's are- the thing, though, right? So that's, that's the thing that gets me about this, is a lot of people who say that they are pro-life when it comes to abortion are also pro-death penalty. And a lot of people they're- who say that they're pro-choice are anti-death penalty. 
So I mean, yeah, if, if it, it's one, of, it seems to be a mixed bag, and I don't get that. Well, you should get it, and the reason you should get it is if you think, if, you know. All morality is based on a foundation, and you have to have a foundation to define your own morality. If you're anti-abortion and you think uh, that it's a living human being in the womb and you're killing something innocent, you can't ever be for it because it's innocent. Right, and that's innocent life versus uh, guilty life uh, conundrum there. Versus the guilty murderer that you execute. So I think you should be able to make that distinction. However... If you think that abortion is just a, a, a living zygote that has no human you know, soul whatsoever, and, and that's what some um, uh, pro-choice people believe, um, <coughs> they can say, well, you know, that's not a human being. That's not a human, like the guy on death row is. He's clearly a human being, <laughs> even though he's not exactly, really. Exactly. He's clearly a human so, being, and so, right, right. I, I get that. All right, that's a, okay, that's so, a good explanation. I mean, uh, well, let, let, we're going to have to wrap here shortly, but I do want to okay. point out one of the main problems that I have with the death penalty, and a lot of people have with the death penalty, is that it's been uh, applied unevenly. That it seems to be that uh, the sentencing, it has? huh? It has. Well, yeah, that's that's that. When we see people being released from death row, it's always poor people, right? And it's it's usually minorities, not always, usually minorities, people who were sentenced to death, and it turns out, well. We, we got to let this guy go because he was sitting on death row or whatever. So especially the poor people, though, because they don't have that kind of representation or they don't always have the money to buy a dream team. Dream team. Okay. Right. I, look, look, I, I, I'm I'm going to not surprisingly disagree with you here. Just to let people know, um, white murderers are twice as likely to be executed as black murderers. And we mean numbers or percentage wise, because that's an important distinction, and people like to play that game. Are we talking about numbers of white murderers or percentage of white murderers? I'm talking talking numbers. I'm talking Mm. absolute numbers. Okay, well, there probably are twice as many white murderers. There's more, probably, because there's more than more than that many white people in the country. I mean, well, not no more. Wait, wait, you you don't, (laughs) you don't, you don't measure by population counts. You measure by criminal criminal counts, and so. Okay, if you if you do it that way, I mean, and that's, I mean, if you look at, there's this huge section on race that I sent you guys. And I'm still back uh, to being if, mostly poor people. That's that's my big thing. Well, no, no. Okay, well, the poor issue is, first of all, by far, the highest percentage of people on death row is for what crime? Robbery, murder. Right. How many rich people commit robbery, murder? Right. Usually, it's a it's a lying in wait or murder for insurance kind of thing with them. It's not right, a uh, exactly. robbery murder, yeah. Okay. All right. So if you look at how many, not committing murders, but if you look at, and, and the same thing goes with women. I mean, f- women make up 52% of the population, but 10% of prison. Why is that? Well, because men commit 90% of the crimes hmm. that are, are prison crimes. So that has a lot to do with it. But it, when you look, no one's going to question that wealthy people can hire better attorneys. And if you hire a better attorney, you're more likely to get a lighter sentence. Get a a better sentence. I mean, I don't think anybody questions that. What they have to understand with wealthy capital murderers are there's there are very, very few of them around. And uh, it's a it's a percentage and or a and or a numbers game. Um, There has been I mean, the feds, I think it was at the last two executions ago, I mean, the feds hardly execute anybody. Right, hardly ever. But, but there was, a, you know, the, they, they did execute a millionaire. They, he was a drug dealer, uh, Garza, and uh, he, was, he was a millionaire. And so, you know, it does happen. It happens okay. rarely. I mean, Houston had a... Houston, I was going to say, Houston. which administration was that? Yeah, that must have been a while ago. Uh, well, I mean, it, it's a long well, time now, ago. I mean, you, had, you had Timothy McVeigh, what, uh, 10 years ago? Right. Before, right. You know, yeah, he was probably like the last one. Or uh, Muhammad. They, uh, they executed Muhammad, too, right? The D.C. sniper. They executed Muhammad John was a, Muhammad was a state case. Oh, that was he? Was I, thought, I thought he was, was interstate. For, that, that was, let me tell you guys. Are you well, guys in California? Yeah, we are. Now, let me do this, though, because okay. we're going to okay. have to have you on a future show. Because, I mean, we could go okay. on. <laughs> I think I told you we're going to be expanding the show. Uh, to a longer, longer time uh, start, starting next that. month. Yeah, so 
uh, we definitely want to have you back on. We're going to be covering the Kevin Cooper case at some point next month also. Um, okay. And that's uh, the big case out here in California. He's, I don't think he's next up at bat, but he's, he's going to be uh, executed here. Um, I, I think he was going to make a point about being in California. That I'm interested in what he was going to okay. say about that. Yeah, let's do it, well, and then now, we're going to have to wrap. Just to make, like I said, um, the reason California has the disaster problem they have is because of the judges in California. And if you see where the death penalty is not being uh, implemented in all the other death penalty states, it's the judges. And I wanted to give you an example because uh, John Mohammed came, out, came up. He's from Virginia. Virginia has executed 111 murderers since 1976 and has done it on an average of seven years of appeals prior to execution. Okay. Seven years, okay? How does Virginia do that? Because the judges don't hold on to the cases forever. They just run them through. And there's not even a whisper of an innocent person being executed in that state, even by the anti-destiny people that make them up every day. And so, well, yeah, in California, though, we I, I testified in a death penalty trial back in the 90s, and uh, the guy's still drawing air. You know, this which, is in the mid 90s. Uh, Regis Dion Thomas was the defendant, and I, I wasn't even okay. going to say his name because he's a waste of skin and an oxygen okay. thief. But okay. uh, uh, he killed two Compton police officers February 22nd, 1993, and uh, he's still sitting on death row. And I testified in the death penalty phase of that case. Well, don't blame anyone but the judges. It sometimes takes seven years. Well, he's been there for, huh. no, you know, no, no. whenever was, whenever they no, get to no, him, no. I'll be there. It sometimes takes seven years for the first appeal to wow. be heard. Okay, seven well, years, okay? Yeah, there's something that's got to be done about that. But when he gets in, when he gets, again, we're going to wrap, but. Okay. And we're going to bring you back for sure. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I want to thank you I, I for just, joining us. I just too. want to ask Dudley one quick question. When you talk, when you say it's the judges, are you talking about the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals? No, no. no. Or are you no. talking about all judges? I'm talking about all of them. Okay. Ju- judges okay. are the case managers, right? They're in charge of time and money. They can delay a case for years before trial. They can delay a case for years before the first appeal, and they do that. Yeah, the Ninth Circuit is by far the worst circuit in the nation with regard to the death penalty. Yeah, we've heard, and they, heard that. They are, they, are reversed, they are reversed by the U.S. Supreme Court more than any other court. That's well, now, how Dud- bad they are. Dudley, yeah. if people want to uh, find out more about your positions on this, do you have a website or uh, some place you can direct them to so they can... Uh, uh, I think you guys have all of that, but what I what I would tell people if they have a, a personal question for me, you're welcome to give them my email. It's all over the internet anyway, um, and the the site that I use the most it's it's not mine, but I, I, a host lets me use his site is um, it's Pro DPNNC, which means Pro Death Penalty in North Carolina, and. The, the guy who cited is his brother was murdered, and that's why he started the site. Okay, I found you by Googling uh, death penalty uh, proponents, and I uh, found your name, and so I Googled you, so I found your email address. So everybody else can do that, too. Well, you can put uh, it on okay. the right yeah, And we'll, right we'll post it on our, our social media also. So, okay, again, thank sir, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, been very informative. and uh, it's, Interesting it's, it's conversation. Nice to have, yeah, it's nice to have a guest who's, who's got such a strong background and uh, who's, who's so well well researched and informed. So um, I, I'm definitely going to have you back on the show, and hopefully you'll join us again. Right. I'd love to. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks, Tony. Thank okay, folks, we're going to start. We are going to wrap our show. But uh, you can send us a tweet at Ride Along Radio. Uh, you can follow us on, uh, like us on Facebook, or follow us on Instagram at uh, Ride Along Radio Show. Or you can send us an email at ridealongradioshow at gmail.com. And uh, that's it for us, and we will catch you uh, next week here on the Ride Along Radio catch Show. Catch on the flip. On the flip side.